Hey, welcome to this session of A World on the Move, where we invite migrants and refugee advocates in particular to join a global conversation on key issues. And remember, we're talking ahead of the UN Summit on Refugees and Migrants, which is on the 19th of September. And we're going to continue this conversation, hopefully with you guys, as we go forward. Now I'm going to talk to Motion. So Motion, you, be, you, were, you were born in, uh, in Kuwait, but you're Syrian. You've been educated in India, uh, and now you're in, now you're in the Netherlands, and you're having trouble getting even a bank account opened. Although I understand fr that you've done some extraordinary things. You once jumped into a freezing river and rescued some people. So what's going on when it comes to integration? Yeah, I moved to Netherlands like two and a half years back. On 25th of December last year, I was like in Amsterdam and I saw one drawing old Dutch uh, uh, man. Then I just jumped jump and picked him up and that, yeah, that gave me a positive feedback in the name of refugee. Uh, everybody welcomed my action. Uh, but till today, I did not get uh, the bank account. Then I was like, why? And I had no answer. He said, sorry, we cannot open an account for you because uh, you are refugees. Uh, in general, refugees are educated and refugees, they just need a chance, you know, they just give a chance to them. Like for me, I had, uh, I got a chance in Amsterdam, I picked to, I saved somebody life from different religion, from different language, from different concept, culture, but I just saved him or I helped him. So that's just a give us a chance and we will show you who we are. So that's a very um, unfortunate situation that you've had to go through, especially given that you have this strong educational background. Fadumo, uh, I see you, you were a refugee in Kenya and I worked in, um, I've worked in several camps in the DAB in particular. In your case in Germany, how has it been dealing with integration issues? I don't like to use the word refugee because that word is taking us into a very vulnerable position, basically giving us number plates. Only the word, the word refugee should only be used in, in legal procedures, in official uh, offices, but not in the social environment because this discriminates and, and this gives a lot of people the opportunity to attack us. Go ahead, Chakra. So, yeah. I just want to disagree with um, that we shouldn't use the word refugee. I'm a Palestinian refugee. I was born a refugee. You know, there's a journey behind that. There's a story behind, you know, my journey and the journey of over 50 million people. It's a result of circumstances that we passed through. There's a strength in there, and we want to make sure that that stigma is deassociated from the word refugee and use it to empower, not to hide behind. When I uh, won last year uh, Esquire Man of the Year, that was the most important thing for me is to say, and this is for the General Assembly too, that any person, a politician, um, an organization, a presidential nominee that wants to go on media and stigmatize refugees should be held accountable today because this is what is calling for hatred. This is what's calling for um for problems, this is what's making our world today worse, not better. When we get someone speaking to 300 million American citizens today about let's build walls and kick refugees out, this should not be okay. Even when we talk in Europe, Europe should look back into the history. There were a refugee crisis among Europeans just a few decades ago. So let's not have a short-term memory when it comes to humanity and to this subject. So we'd like to turn to Tafan if we could now. You have an extraordinary story. I know you're in Sweden and you and you you've you've been a social entrepreneur. You've a lot you've offered a lot. Tell us a little bit about your history and try and reflect on what you've heard already from people who've gone through very difficult circumstances as forced migrants. Um, I came to Europe when I was a toddler. I was two, three years old. I'm Kurdish. Uh, hundreds of, and thousands of men and women and children were executed. Um, so my parents decided we have to leave. My father stayed in the military and, and me and my mom and my sister eventually came to Sweden just the way that people do today. Life was great for me at that time. I didn't know much. Um, but as I was growing up, there was something about just simply being Kurdish. You're Kurdish, you don't have a country, you're stateless, you don't belong anywhere. Go back to where you came from, wherever that is. And I felt isolated. And I think this is a very, very important uh, topic to discuss. Just recently, I was attacked 
uh, by two uh, ethnical Swedish men here in Sweden as I was uh, taking Lord. a walk uh, an evening. Um, and it was, I guess, because I was just simply not Swedish enough for them, which is absolutely ridiculous because I see myself more Swedish. I know that I'm everything that Europe and Sweden stands for. And uh, there are people just like me who are extremely grateful for everything they've been given. I wish that the kind of help that I hope to give people and children today in Sweden, that that kind of help was around when I was younger. I am a first generation Iranian American. My parents had to, well, my mother's family fled Iran. Uh, because of the Iranian revolution. My parents' life was turned upside down and they've done everything they can to give us the opportunities to be educated and find employment. A lot of refugees that leave conflict zones, they all have different levels of, of education and skill, but we need to develop long-term sustainable solutions for their integration. In Europe, there is a major employment gap and an aging population. So there needs to be a more sustained effort to match up jobs with with people who can fill them but at the same time we've talked a lot about employability and integration in the country of destination but what about at the root cause of it all what needs to be done to prevent the number of refugees rising and forced displacement in general i think we, there was this um, uh, notion that unless there is until there is conflict until there is armed conflict um you know nations are at peace these countries have been unstable for, for many years. More and more you saw um, lack of education and lack of jobs being created and increased poverty. When someone came in 1990 to Liberia to say, right, we're coming to liberate you, people, you know, before you had the situation where you were forcing child soldiers, people were willing to fight for freedom. Um, given that you, as a, yourself, your story, you had to flee yeah. when you were four years old. What contributes to children get, be, becoming child soldiers in the first place and how do you think we can get them out of this situation? My first encounter with child soldiers was at the age of four. Um, my mom and I were already arrested and at that point they could, have, they could have taken me, but he did not have enough space in his car, which is why I got left. So um, it, it, wow. it, it's just, it, it's, not, it's not something that you know, you, you kind of plan for it. Just it just happens. What do you do now in terms of now that we know how child soldiers come into being, how they're lured into rebel groups and so on? We we're seeing that Sierra Leone is has been deemed as one of the countries that are on the trend of the African rising uh, um, narrative. Before Ebola, we had double digit um, GDP growth. For us, the building the nation is investing in people so that they are able to take part in their national development. So that's that's our focus: is education. We run full schools, vocational training, and we even training young people to um, to engage in farming. We're working with, with with farmers. This year, we're working with about 100 farmers. Great, PJ. Look, that's really inspirational, and you've been a terrific guest. I mean, everybody on the program has been today, but I think your story really has sent shivers down the spine of everybody. The really terrifying and very realistic, and and the way you've taken it forward would be a very important message for the UN summit as well. I think, and it's one of you know the the way forward. So. What message you would like to pass on to the General Sum Assembly summit in September? What I want to ask to to the General Assembly is uh, uh, to have a plan to find a long-term solution. The second step is we need to find a, a way to protect these people in this transit country. Only this year, we lost around 3,000 people who lost life in the Mediterranean Sea. Most of them is women with children. Why? Because lackness of humanitarian visa, a family reunification visa. So we need to facilitate all this legal way to reach Europe or uh, other place to ask asylum and to get protection. And, uh, I think the responsibility is on all sides, but you absolutely are right. There needs to be certainly more humanitarian protection because we have an arc of instability, as is often said, reaching all the way from the Himalayas to West Africa. And that's where the forced migration is most seen. Look, we thank you very much for joining us. It's been a really terrific discussion today. Uh, your messages to the UN Summit will be heard loud and clear, I know that. Uh, thanks for joining us. Come back again. And uh, please encourage your, your friends and others to put their profiles on the I'm a migrant, I'm a refugee platform, because that is the way we get your stories out. 
And that is how we have you here on the program today. So thank you all very much and all the best.